is a reading from the notebooks by Maria Voltorta, 1944, July 30th. I don't know how I shall be able to describe, for I feel so ill with heart trouble that I cannot remain seated except with difficulty. It's really difficult. I must describe what I see. I receive light on today's gospel, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. There follows a text concerning the episode of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, which has been included in the Passion Cycle. What effort I really can't manage. At 4 p.m., when I recovered a little, I wrote what I had to write since last night. I was observing the hour of Mary's desolation, which I could not observe on Friday night, and, while contemplating Jesus lying on the marble of the stone for anointing, with his mother alongside, weeping and kissing his pierced hands, I noticed and wondered why Jesus' face right after death, that is, when he was placed on that stone, looked more like the face of the living Jesus in its thinness and beauty than it did on the road to Calvary, on the cross, and as it later appears on the Turin Shroud, older and wearier, but slender and noble as usual. Jesus replied to me, Because on the road to Calvary I was heated, to mescent, with my veins protruding from fever and exhaustion, and with an initial swelling already from the retention of urea, following upon the atrocious scourging. On the cross, all of that further increased. After death, when the agony had ceased and fluids had been partially emptied out, both naturally and from the lance thrust, my face suddenly thinned. The lavaker of my mother's tears also served to restore a more habitual appearance to my face. But on the Turin Shroud, the face of someone dead for several hours appears. The usual process of edema had already begun, then, all the more intense than someone killed with torture like mine. It is the transudates spreading from the serous membranes which makes you say that a dead person looks the way he did when alive. It is the great pacification which death extends over even the most tortured faces. In addition, consider that the image appears on a cloth and is fixed upon it through a process of natural aromas and salts. You know that any stain on a cloth appears prone to expand, but in reality the features of my face on the morning of the resurrection, that is, when I ceased to be covered by the Turin Shroud, were swollen in this way. Life returned to the living one, but during those forty hours I was quite dead, and in no way different from every man who is a prey to death. I did not decompose because of the swift resurrection, but my body was subject to the rules common to dead bodies, especially those dying of innumerable, innumerable wounds. I, as victim, wanted to annihilate myself in this respect, too. All decomposition begins with swelling. Let this be directed to all who still have doubts about the veracity of my death. I am certain he said this because he has now repeated it to me, since I was afraid I would not write with precision after a number of hours. Then on July 31st, a reference to Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. Jesus unexpectedly speaks while I am making my daily offerings, and thus have not opened any book, and his voice resounds clearly and swiftly for me, mentioning the verse and bringing me to understand that it is today's lesson. Jesus says then, Let the dead bury their dead. The dead of the dead are vain concerns, the cares of the world, and affections felt in a human way. The living should not be concerned about these dead things. This is what he had said at once. He then continued, I use the term dead for those who, because they have not given themselves entirely to life, are rendered heavy and slow, cold and inactive, like dead or dying bodies. The dead are not just the notably dead, with no more trace of life, that is, those who, because of their sins, belong to Satan. Those who, because of their lukewarmness and quietism, lack impulses towards goodness, are also dead. They are like stones not buried in the depths of the ground, but resting upon it. A stone, even if it is not buried, does not move by its own power. A foot is needed to roll it, a hand to throw it, so that it will go further. These souls that I would call embryonic souls, for with their apathy they have atrophied, becoming ever so faint and extremely weak, are no different from those stones. Mercifully, my hand sometimes picks them up and tosses them to see if I can make them desirous of movement. <clears throat> but they proceed only as far as I throw them, and then fall back into immobility. My friends, with their penances, examples, and words, spur them on and drag them upwards. But as soon as they are left alone, they then stop. That is, 
if they don't slide back down to the place where they were before, attached like oysters to the cliff of life and like moss to the trunk of humanity. They live for these two things, which pass as quickly as summer lightning. I call them, I indicate to them, come, follow me, but they are unable to do so. To follow me means to make life and humanity secondary and God and the Spirit the principal concern. They are unable because they are unwilling to do this. To you and my faithful disciples I say, let the dead bury their dead. Follow me, passing above everything which is not of God. Follow me, neglecting every voice which is not my voice. Follow me without any concern except to do what I ask you. My true followers must be even freer than the foxes and the birds, without attachment to the things of the world, not even to the nest and the foxhole. An attachment which creates an obstacle to following me, for I do not condemn a holy affection for one's native home. I too felt this, but, do you see, I was able to detach myself from my home and mother to do God's will, to love everything in God in holy fashion, beginning on earth, start to love as you will in heaven, that is, by giving those dear to you, relatives and friends, the assistance which charity suggests, but not the absolute affection which keeps you from loving me more than them. You love them more than me if, when having to choose between doing something pleasing to God and doing something pleasing to them, you prefer to please them and displease me. O oh, my beloved, observe the face of your Jesus as you walk. Observe it as what is most beautiful and deserving of every gaze. Let others and other things be observed by way of me. Oh, if into everything you do or say or love you were to introduce love for me as a sieve, how pure and holy your affections would become. They would be stripped of all selfishness and rendered more tenuous, but much more precious, perfectly precious. They would become a source of good for you and those you love. I tell you this, little John. I want you to come without any nooses slowing down your flight. Rise up above what is earth. There is so much heaven for you. The foxes have holes, and the birds' nests. The Son of Man had nowhere to rest his head. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, and Luke chapter 9, verse 58. But the little John has a pillow and a nest, the heart and the breast of his Jesus, but he must have nothing but that. But let all that is not your master and of your master fall away. There are so many of the dead to concern themselves with the dead. Be someone who is alive, and concern yourself only with Jesus as life. Come and rest.